like the thing that I railed against, like changing your art and selling out and writing different types of songs to appeal to an audience. I realized, but like even without me actively thinking about that, I had done it. I had basically built background music. I created background music for people to study to. I was like, fuck. Una dose pizza. In 2009, Pop Loose, my band, we had our first viral video. There's a difference between your work, your art, the stuff that you make, and then the packaging around it. What kind of box you use, metaphorically. It's a metaphorical box. There's no boxes on the internet, but you know what I mean. Like what kind of box you use, the color of the paper, whether it has a bow, if there's a little clear plastic thingies you can see inside a piece of the box. Like Pop Loose adjusted our packaging and the packaging made all the difference. What I learned from that as a creator was so important and so critical. I wanted to kind of make a talk about it to, to share with folks um, how I think about how to basically market and package your art. When I was in college, um, I used to play shows at a venue called the Coho. This is the campus coffee house. There were people studying and having meetings and working on problem sets and basically half listening to the background music that was distracting them from their work. At the end of four years of this, four years of playing shows in a venue whose ultimate purpose was to provide a place for studying and eating, I looked back at the hundreds of songs that I'd written and I was surprised to find out that they were all soft. The lyrics were quiet and benign and harmless. The chord progressions were unprovocative and plain and accommodating. The whole vibe of the songs was just easy and unchallenging. I had inadvertently taken my musical soul and adjusted it to fit the shape of the coho, to fit the constraints and the conditions of the venue. This was the artistic version of evolution, but instead of a biological being, it was art adjusting its way to survival and success within a particular ecosystem given a specific set of constraints and conditions in that ecosystem that helps certain works thrive and cause certain works to fail. But the concept of the venue affecting the art that's created within it, this is different than how a venue can change your perception of a work of art. It's different than say how the same painting can look different in two different frames or how the David is showcased in Florence. Quick tangent here about the David because I think it's a great example of how a venue can change our perception of art. The whole hallway leading up to the David sculpture is lit from the side with tungsten lighting. And in the spectrum of light, tungsten glows slightly yellow. Its color temperature is around 3200 Kelvins. And unlike daylight, which is slightly bluer, tungsten light feels like the inside of a house. But David, at the end of this yellow hallway, is situated directly beneath a fucking epic skylight, shining blue directly onto the David, like the freaking heavens themselves are saying, check this shit out. This light is set to uh, 5,600 Kelvin. So it's blue. This is like basically imitating, uh, imitating um, daylight. And then I've got a light switch here that's gonna turn on these tungsten bulbs. And I'm gonna try and turn off the daylight bulb at the same time with this remote control. So this is daylight. This is 5,600 Kelvin. And this is 3,300 Kelvin. 5,600, blue. 3300, yellow. Do you see the difference between those types of lights? You can even see the color and light quality difference in the photo. Look at how yellow this hallway is compared to how blue the David area is. Look at the soft shadows on the hallway sculpture coming from the sideways lights in the hallway compared to the ultra high contrast light on the David. Actually don't know for a fact, but I bet you my life savings that the team that designed this venue thought specifically about the experience of rounding this corner, looking down this hallway at this particular statue. I bet they thought about and spent a shit ton of money on the lighting and composition and vibe of this space because they knew that the frame matters. But to end my tangent, this is different than my experience at the Coho. The Coho wasn't just a frame that affected the audience's perception of my art. The Coho changed my art itself. That's when I learned that the venue affects the art. The Coho selected against a set of criteria and in doing so influenced which art thrived and which art failed. The criteria, the environment, the context, the principles of selection influenced which art survived and which art died. A venue is more than just a frame that changes our perception of art. 
Whether you're making music for the co, whether you're a designer building things for this venue or this venue, or if you're a monkey turning into a human, or if you hang with a group of friends that does this on Friday nights, or you hang with a different group of friends that does that on Friday nights, our environment and the criteria it selects for changes us. It affects our direction, our behaviors, our creations. The venue affects the art. This was a key learning for me, that the ecosystem in which your art lives can determine whether your art lives or dies. So what the heck do you do about this? I say, adjust your packaging, not your soul. I enjoy art and making art. I also enjoy the business stuff. I enjoy marketing. I enjoy experimentation. I enjoy um, like the kind of mechanics of, of figuring out the system. I, was, I feel like a little guilty about saying that because I like it so much. If you find some wins there, it can be a tipping point. Three years after ruining my music at the Coho, Pomplamoose made a much smaller adjustment to our packaging that made all the difference. Today, Pomplamoose has about 150 million views on YouTube, but when we started publishing videos in 2008, we would get about 4,000 views on one video, 2,000 views on the next, nothing crazy. We were trying everything we could to grow. We even booked a show at a local laundromat that held 40 people called Brainwash Cafe. We weren't desperate, we were just trying everything we could, and one day I noticed something that kind of blew my mind. When you search for the Beatles on YouTube, the Beatles, when you search for the Beatles on YouTube, the first video that popped up was a gal named Julia Ooh, Noons. All my loving, the Beatles. Julia Noons, number one. Keep in mind, it's 2009 at this point. It's the idea of search engine optimization as it relates to music, the idea of performing cover songs on YouTube. This was not a widespread phenomenon yet. But searching for the Beatles and finding Julia Noons felt amazing to me. That's when we decided that the next Pop Moose video would be a song that had a massive volume of search traffic. We had a hunch that Beyonce's single ladies would probably get some buzz at the VMAs. So a couple days before the award show, Natalie and I recorded a cover. At the VMAs, Kanye West stole the microphone out of Taylor Swift's hands and said, I I'm really happy for you, I'm gonna let you finish, but Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. Do you guys remember that? So two things happened. First, the internet exploded. Second, <laughs> everyone went onto their computers the next day and searched for Beyonce single ladies, and it generated that spike in search traffic for that term. That's also precisely when Pomplamoose uploaded our cover, and in one night we got 500,000 hits on the video. There was a lot of luck involved in that. A week later, when we showed up to play our show at the local laundromat, there were 200 people inside, and 200 people outside waiting to see the show. But the truth is, nothing had changed. We were playing the same songs with the same singer, the same harmony, the same rhythms, the same voice leading, the same production, the same mixing, the same mastering, the same soul. We had made a slight adjustment in song choice. That's it, song choice. It had made all the difference. It felt incredible to me, like we had taken our music and put it in a blue box instead of a freaking red one, and it changed everything by just adjusting our packaging. And we didn't even have to take our musical soul and stomp all over it. We had limited the adjustment to the packaging around our music instead of the music itself. Here's how I think about it. The stuff inside the box, that's the stuff I care about. As an artist, you kind of know what you're into and what you're not into. It's just a preference thing. And the things that are really important to you, those are the things that are in your box. Like the things that you keep coming back to, the things that just make you, you, the things that, that make your voice specific and different from everyone else's voice. That's the stuff that's in your box. The stuff inside the box is my soul. And it's different for everybody. For me, it's harmony and melody and voice leading, production, differentiation, attitude, musicianship, unexpected. Like, that chord is normal. That chord is unexpected. Tenacity, humor, love, texture, timbre, thoughtfulness, tight songwriting, craft, Right? These are the things that make me, me. This is my musical soul. I won't compromise on this stuff. It's who I am. Changing these things, that's the mistake that I made at the Coho. Changing these things is selling out for me. But there's a lot of stuff that I don't care about. Turns out that stuff is equally important. That's the stuff outside of my box. That's the packaging. The stuff like song choice, visual branding, how my music is marketed, whether or not my music has videos, 
when I upload my songs, which website I use to distribute my videos, getting mainstream press, using a particular instrument like a guitar, who listens to my music. I don't give a shit about this stuff. When I've changed something that's been in my box, when I've compromised on that, the, the, the depth of regret is like out of control. <laughs> like doing something, changing your art in a way to appease people is like, and then listening back to those songs, uh, it's like to think about having a catalog of that stuff, of having years and years of material that is compromise. Um, I can't think of anything that like makes me feel more sad as an artist than than like owning the hand uh, that 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 held the pen that wrote those songs. Um, man, that's just not worth it. It's not worth changing your soul. I'll adjust my packaging all day long. I don't care what color the box is. <laughs> and I've continued that philosophy since this talk. And actually, since I learned it with, with Pomplamoose in 2009 for the last 11 years, Pomplamoose has been doing all different kinds of stuff. We've tried a hundred different things around types of videos and, um, you know, doing 3D projection mapping and um, doing, you know, narrative videos and vlog style videos and stories and, We've tried so many different things. Um, and all that stuff in my mind is like, is packaging. It's, it's the, it houses the essence of our soul. It, it contains what makes us, us. This is the great stuff. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed in the morning. This is the stuff that fuels my pilot light. It's the only reason I can push forward and write the next scene and record the next instrument and build the next set and shoot the next take and color the next frame and design the next synth. It's the only reason I can bear the pain of working to publish. Because it's these things, it's my soul, it's the reason that I exist. And that stuff is never worth compromising. So I say, adjust your packaging, not your soul.